Um, hello, good morning. Uh, I'm Sanjay Bhatnagar, and I'll talk to you about uh, uh, some of the prototyping work we have done towards NG data processing systems uh, in our group. Uh, I must apologize here that I'll, this might introduce uh, uh, a dose of reality that might spoil some of your very happy feelings, and I apologize for that. <coughs> um, how do I go forward? Okay. Uh, so to develop a roadmap for the kind of work that we do in this in in, in, our, in our group, we have to navigate uh, complex uh, interaction between these three pieces, uh, which is scientific use cases and telescope cap capabilities, and the uh, algorithms that are required to deliver those science use cases and the size of computing. And for this talk and discussion today, I'm going to keep this box as as a given and uh, not vary really that, and figure out uh, the navigation between these two things. <laughs> Uh, so the first thing that we need to do is uh, develop a model that will give us an estimate of the size of computing, specifically, specifically here for NGVL and ALMA. And the process very quickly we follow, details are in that memo, is that we took the KSGs and converted them to the algorithms needed so that we could develop uh, theoretical scaling laws for the computing needed. Uh, those scaling laws have some coefficients that we measured by running actual code and arrived at two uh, two conclusions here. One is uh, unsurprising that in an end-to-end -end imaging pipeline, the dominant computing cost comes from the imaging, imaging step. And if you break open the imaging steps itself, there's one step which is known in the radio astronomy jargon as major cycle, which consumes 90% of your computing load. That's an unsurprising result, but it's quantified, so it's good. The other is uh, to put uh, uh, our measurements on what is called the roof line plot in the HPC community, where you plot on the y-axis is the uh, capability of the computer that you're using, uh, and on the x-axis is the, is the characterization of the algorithms you are running in terms of the number of floating point operations you do per byte of data loaded into the memory. The slopes here are the memory bandwidth at various uh, hierarchical memories in the computer you use, and this blue line at the top is the peak uh, uh, computing performance. The goal is to have algorithms which lie well under the roof here. If you are in this part of the, if your algorithms are in this part of this curve, you'll scale by putting, by using more and more computers, parallelization. If you're in that part, parallelization will not help. So, I, and, and, and luckily, at least for CPUs, our algorithms are here. When you put uh, this in a roof line plot for a GPU, we get pretty close to that, so there's some work required there. Uh, the other conclusion is that as somebody said earlier, uh, John said earlier, that our estimate is that based on the average data rates coming out of these uh, KSGs, is that we need a system with a computer which is about 50 petaflop per, per second kind of a computer. And I uh, say that average data rates, because the, the, the data rates coming out of the various KSPs are, are, are distributed like that, most of them require low data rates. But some of them require data rates that if you design a computer for that, you will be in the excess exaflop per, per second kind of a computer required. And then Raphael applied the queuing theory from computer science uh, to characterize the, uh, to put a parameter that you can tweak to figure out, uh, to navigate trade-off between latency and affordability. And this 50 petaflop uh, computer basically corresponds to uh, latency of about a day from a steady state of processing queues to uh, high data rate uh, KSGs coming on, disturbing the, uh, and, uh, disturbing the queue and producing a backlog. And this parameter is basically how long it does it, the system take to come back to the steady state. And this corresponds to a, about a recovery time of a day. Uh, so given all that, we can convert that into the size of computer we need. And our estimate is that if you run 50 petaflop computer on only CPUs require about a million way parallelization. That is pretty daunting. But the total computing available that actually can be used by these kind of things is pretty high. And I'll throw these numbers at you and you can multiply your estimates of how many desktops that are available and how many GPUs are available. And you can convince yourself that amount of computing available in the system, in the system meaning in the, in the academic system, for example, is pretty high. The problem is that our usage of it, the efficiency of our usage is very, very low. It's actually embarrassingly low. It's single digits percentages. So the, 
the problem that becomes that needs a solution and where groups like ours work is this how do we increase our efficiency of the available computing power and the answers we came up to by discussions with various SPC experts and reading a lot of literature actually I read a lot of literature is that we need need new kind nine new kind of hardware and therefore new kind of algorithms that utilize that hardware hardware well we need a flexible architecture and uh, a way to manage the resulting complexity and I'll I'll go through some of them uh, in my slides here uh, I read a lot of literature but I'll summarize this paper which I found very nice it's uh, it's it's an overview paper in science magazine where the title has this there's plenty of room at the top that's a pun on the statement made by Richard Feynman more than 60 years ago which said there's a room at the bottom and the top and the bottom they're talking of is the computing stack which the bottom is the silicon the the semiconductor technology and the top is where we operate uh, so the algorithms and software and all that a bunch of complex uh, uh, technologies in between um, but what what is meant by uh, this room at the bottom is what also is known as the Moore's law era which is shown in this uh, in this plot where x-axis the time and y-axis is either the relative uh, CPU clock or, or performance in the in the black curves, which basically kept on improving uh, as a function of time. So you write a piece of code and if it doesn't run fast enough, you just have to wait on the next computer, it'll run two times faster. That was Moore's era. <laughs> that has ended when it ended uh, the clock cycles that CPUs run flattened out, it's not improving at all. But that led to the multi core era, which is what the CPUs we use, which helped for a while if you have an algorithm that can utilize that. These cores are general purpose, uh, general purpose CPUs, not, uh, and therefore only certain number of them can be packed before you run out of uh, silicon real estate. So that's not a path uh, that I think can scale to a million wave parallelization. And anyway, that, that has stopped. So there are only that many cores that you can uh, fit, even if you had an algorithm that fits into that. And that's what led to the conclusion that uh, there's room at the top and now innovation in software efficiency, algorithms is what is going to give you gains in, in runtime performance. Uh, this is what is they are showing, they collected the data and put it in this plot, which is this is uh, time and this is related runtime performance of the algorithms, which is shown in the, in the dark curve. And the dotted curve is a given algorithm writing the, the, writing the Moore's law. So you come up with an algorithm and you write the Moore's law and then somebody comes with a better algorithm to solve the same problem, which improves the runtime performance by a factor of 10, and then you write that. Uh, but you are here and now a given algorithm is, if it's not sufficient in runtime performance, you can't just wait and expect that it will improve. You have to uh, develop a new algorithm and or get, get more efficient one way or the other. So to navigate this, we concluded that we need a architecture algorithmic architecture which uh, is flexible for evolving computing needs evolving computer algorithms new algorithms will come along and the computer and hardware uh, hard computing software and hardware both of which are going to evolve quite rapidly and what we arrived at is a uh, simple thing which is uh, that most known algorithms successful algorithms that are in the uh, critical path of all telescopes at least <coughs> is are based on uh, just simple chi-square minimization and iterative chi-square minimization. What that needs are three major pieces which require computing. One is the derivative calculation, that's the major cycle in the radio sonomy jargon. Uh, calculation of the step size that you need to take to go down the uh, chi-square surface and a way to update your parameters. And you can convince yourself that if you plug in the right kind of parameters and do your complex calculus, you can arrive, uh, you, th this, this system will deliver self-cal, pointing self-cal, all kind of imaging algorithms, direction-dependent corrections, and all that. So this is a flexible, algorithmically flexible architecture. To test it, we had to put it in a um, in an execution graph, uh, which is iterative, uh, and to put that, it also simplified things that it clearly specified uh, or broke up the problem into a different kind of blocks. Uh, blue box here are represent the radio astronomy. Uh, domain implementations, orange boxes, are computer science, SPC kind of implementation. I mean, what it does is also utilizes the human capital you have. If you 
if you tell a computer scientist, I'll look, please help us, but you have to understand this whole thing, that's overwhelming. But if you tell them that, hey, you, you do something good here and let me take care of the rest, they say, okay, yeah, let's, let's work together. So that improved the utilization of your computing, uh, of your human capital as well. Uh, <clears throat> and if you do a specialized implementation of various boxes, I'm showing here, you can uh, generate imaging. If you do a different specialization, you can generate calibration. Uh, uh, so, uh, I, I pulled out two examples uh, for this box and that box, and those I pulled out because these are algorithms that deliver direction-dependent calibration and imaging kind of algorithms, but with algorithms that are very high computational uh, if, uh, arithmetic intensity, which is the number of flops per byte of data you load. Uh, I won't be able to go into the details, but uh, those are the algorithms like W projection or A projection, or AW projection, inospheric correction can be thrown in, pointing error correction can be thrown in, mosaicing is included, and those kind of things at very high arithmetic intensity. Uh, this is just to show that this is not a pie in the sky theoretical analysis. These algorithms exist, and you apply to real data, good things happen. If, for example, here, if you don't correct for the effect of the primary beams, the Fidelity of the image rapidly deteriorates when you go away from the center of the beam outwards. But if you apply these, uh, good things happen. Uh, so these are real algorithms which give real tangible results. Similarly, this box is, is the minor cycle where you can uh, implement a, a variety of algorithms. I have chosen three. Uh, Ogbaum is what most people understand and use. But if you go to more sophisticated algorithms with higher computational efficiency, uh, you can convince yourself that those will scale now. <clears throat> this is just to show the same thing, which I'll skip on. Uh, one slide on arithmetic intensity, and the two points I want to uh, emphasize here, that radiosonim algorithms have high computational efficiency, which is, which is a very good thing. But uh, different parts of the execution graph have diff require different kind of computers. So what this also means that you should design upfront in your, in your system that your, the entire iterative system will be running on a very heterogeneous computing environment. Uh, so that, uh, the framework that I said does scale as a, uh, for computing needs and algorithmic needs, does it also scale in terms of deployment on, on computers? And so we actually did this de deployment and I uh, was very pleased to see that in a very short amount of time, we were able to develop this on a CPU then with a flip of a switch, deploy it on a GPU and make the uh, measurements, which I'll show you later. Then uh, with very little work in these orange boxes, go to a cluster of CPUs and GPUs, which are of different variety. Uh, and then now we are going to wide area networks, some of the performance calculation uh, measurements that we did, that's what I'll show you here. So we took this system, deployed on a bunch of CPUs, 200 of them, this is the old graph, but I, we have been able to push the scaling to 200, and after that it starts flattening out. But these are hundreds of CPUs before which it starts flattening out. We are looking for a million way parallelization. So this is not the route, uh, this is not the scaling route that one could take. <clears throat> so we were looking for a new hardware to deploy it on, the hardware we deployed it on, or it's, uh, this, this piece is on a GPU, where we got to few times to, uh, two orders of magnitude improvement in runtime compared to a single CPU, which basically means a huge reduction in the complexity. 200 of these processes running, which was very brittle actually, uh, collapses into a single process running on a single GPU. And what it does it, uh, to the runtime stack is that it reduces, it, it normalizes it to a very nice place where there is no single uh, high nail and the, the overheads which are in green and red here also go down. So you can convince yourself that now this graph, when you, you put it on a larger and larger number of cores, uh, this will scale. Uh, this is just to show that there are real tangible, when I put my radio astronomy hat here, this kind of imaging would otherwise take a, about a week per major cycle. If you do it on CPUs, can be done in a few hours now. <clears throat> but even there, uh, this is all good, but this also results, it has come down from a million to a few thousand GPUs running, but few thousand GPUs. So we still have a, another step to go for scaling, and what we are testing there is to what I call uh, computing at a national scale. So what we do is we trigger 
imaging from here and the major cycle. This box is deployed uh, throughout the United States actually at this point. We collect the images that come here, bring it back to a big computer and at an RAO where the minor cycle runs and then the, the model image is spread back again and again. This I don't unfortunately have any scaling curves to show you here, but uh, the indications are that this will scale actually. Uh, so we will be doing those tests uh, in the coming time. The last two slides, uh, so all this work leads to what kind of software outlook. We need to focus on al uh, developing algorithms with uh, higher arithmetic intensity, with Hawks eye on complexity, I must emphasize that. Uh, heterogeneous computing is in, is in our future. Performance engineering tools, this is a technical thing that I will not be able to get into the details of. But uh, keeping the thing simple requires that you build scientific functionality based on simple components. At this point, we are actually running these, our software, the prototype software with commercial vendors. They're helping us with prototyping it and, uh, and, um, and we're doing some performance measurement. This is for planners, uh, managers, that Moorsera was characterized by minimizing time for development. So that is where most of the thinking is. Post Moore era, which is where we are now, uh, the premium is on mi minimizing the runtime. Ease of programming is a secondary concern. So my apologies to Python uh, affectionado, but, but that route that, okay, write everything in Python because it's easy to, easy to program is unlikely to lead you to a happy place. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there is a paradigm shift and we should not stick to the paradigm which was appropriate for the past decades and will not be applicable for the coming decades. And with this, I'll leave you with some pretty pictures and take some, some questions if you might have. Uh, quick question for Sanjay before we break for coffee and tea. Thank you. So for the, um, for the, the peak compute requirements, presumably those are not random, like they're, they're part of the scheduling that you can predict. Do you think that compute availability would actually fold back into scheduling, like to, to determine when you do what? Um, so first of all, that is not random. Uh, those, those will, but they don't come very often. That is, that is the expectation whether that uh, where we will get the computing for that and whether that will get into the part of the schedule uh, i think it's early early to say because we really don't know what we'll do whether we will do it as part of the telescope or a, an area will be supporting that or it'll be some other facility that that will take care of that those are tbd and i think for john and others to chime in there i give them numbers give them reality so that they can Produce a real, realistic uh, operations plan. Hey, Sanjay, nice talk. Um, both the SK and the NGVLA are centrally core, uh, concentrated, mm -hmm. considerably so, uh, which means that there are probably few, maybe no science use cases that can take advantage of all the antennas. Is that reflected in some of your? I guess use cases or in in what your starting your starting conditions essentially. So uh, there are two parts of this answer. One is that uh, the size of computing estimates actually takes care of that, but there is an algorithmic issue there that with that kind of a UV coverage, you should be able to benefit and develop algorithms that do better than the current current way of doing that. There's some work going on in that direction. I not really prepared to uh, share the results just yet, but in maybe coming months we will. What that will do, the computing is also TBD, but, but yeah, there, there is work to be done there, yes. Good point. <laughs>